Good morning. Welcome to Trinity. We're glad you could be with us in worship this morning. If you're visiting with us today, we invite you to take out the information card that's in the pew rack in front of you. You can fill that out and put it in the offering plate later in the service. We'd love to know that you were here. And also, if you'd like any more information about Trinity, we'd love to pass that along to you as well. Um, if you have your bulletin, um, I'm going to go over just a few announcements. Starting with today, there is an interest meeting for the Puerto Rico uh, disaster relief trip uh, that's in January. That meeting will be right after this um, service in the youth room. Uh, at 4.30 this afternoon, our church council meeting will be held uh, downstairs. That's for all of our committee chair people. And then at 6 o'clock, we have a church Italian potluck dinner. So bring an Italian dish, and uh, there will be things to go along with that. And uh, that will be in the fellowship hall at 6 o'clock. And then our children will eat and then go to their, their choir uh, practice at, uh, as soon as they can. And then Wednesday night, we have a special dinner. It'll be our Thanksgiving uh, dinner for, with um, turkey and dressing. And then our regular activities this Wednesday for children, youth, and adults. Um, on Thursday, something different, uh, men's night out. They will be meeting in the youth room instead of going to a restaurant. Uh, they're going to have barbecue pork and chicken that will be cooked by Mike Killian and Brad Perkins. And they know what they're doing with barbecue. So if you've ever had their, their stuff before, it's great. There'll be sides and everything. Um, so they just ask if you bring uh, $5 to chip in. And uh, they'll be putting the game on the big screen as well in the youth room. Then on Monday, uh, not this Monday, but the following Monday, November 25th, we have a church Christmas decorating time. That'll be at 6.30. That's for families, anybody who wants to come and help decorate the church for Christmas. And it's really cool when it gets finished. You can take a before and after shot of the uh, sanctuary if you'd like, because it looks really different once they get it once everything gets up. So that's on the, uh, November the 25th. Then the first day of Advent is on Sunday, December the 1st. Um, we will have an Advent wreath making event. That's a lunch. Uh, we'll take a break from chili and uh, barbecue and dressing. Uh, we'll have um, chili and hot dogs uh, that that day for lunch. That's hosted by our children's committee, but that's for everyone. Um, there's no cost, but uh, donations will be accepted. And then uh, out in the gathering area, you'll notice there's a Christmas tree up. That is our global missions offering display. Our RAs, GAs, and mission friends made the ornaments that are on the tree. Our goal is to empty the tree. So if you make donations to, to uh, global missions, uh, take an ornament or if you want five ornaments, however many ornaments you would like. And I know that feels weird to take them off the tree before Christmas, but that's kind of the goal. Um, and there's some other decorations out there, some new things that they've done this year as well. So uh, you can check out that display uh, the rest of this month and then all of December. And then finally, our youth are doing um, affirmation stockings. Uh, if you would like to send a note of encouragement or affirmation to our youth, the lists are in the gathering area uh, and the youth hallway, as well as some little slips of paper if you'd like to use those. Um, the actual stockings are in the youth hallway, so you'd have to go there to put them in, but you can get the list here in the gathering area. Um, and one other thing, I'm sorry, the, her name is not in the bulletin, but Claire Horton will be accompanying our adult choir uh, on the flute for their, their um, song today. Is that wrong? No, that's right. Okay. <laughs> she's she's, she's her a little embarrassed now. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right. I'll ask you to please stand now for the passing of the peace or the waving of the peace since it is flu season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
there's a guy named uh, Tony Jones. He wrote a book called The Sacred Way. And at the beginning of the book, he, writes a, he tells a story about when he was actually writing the book. He did a lot of that sitting in coffee shops. And he was at a coffee shop in a mall one day. And it was raining really hard. He saw this new, brand new BMW parked at the very edge of the parking lot, most likely so it wouldn't get dinged by a car. He said the wind started to blow, and it picked up, and then he noticed a shopping cart, and it began to roll. The parking lot was pretty much empty, and you know what happens. That um, uh, shopping cart rolled all the way across the parking lot and slams into the front quarter panel of that brand new BMW. Mike Rogers was really disturbed by that story this morning. He said, didn't that preacher want to go out there and get that shopping cart? And I said, I think it was raining too hard and it was going too fast, it was too late. And he thought, there's no way it's gonna hit that car. So Joan said that that's how he sometimes feels about God, that God finds him even when he tries to hang out or hide out at the edge of the parking lot. Today, we're looking at how much God loves us and the links that God goes to, to reach us. Welcome to worship. Please join me in prayer. Oh God, we are grateful for this beautiful fall morning and for the people gathered around us to worship. May we hear you today, both in this service and every day, as we look for the many ways that you reach out to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of supplication, hymn number 63, Abide With Me. Please stand as we sing together.
Please be seated. So Amy and I actually got to go on a date for a first time in what I can only imagine felt like forever. After dinner, we were both feeling really great, and it wasn't because of the steak dinner I just had, but for the first time in a very, very long time, we had a peaceful and quiet meal. No telling kids to leave each other alone or get off the ground or take that out of your mouth, take that out of your mouth or don't put that in your nose. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Amy and I's date wasn't completely silent. We enjoyed each other's company with conversation and laughter. And there was the entire restaurant. But it was comforting. In 2013, there was a medical publication by a group of doctors from Duke University that stated that two hours of silence could create new cells in the hippocampus region of the brain. And I'm not sure if I said that correctly or not, but... This area of the brain is linked to learning, remembering, and emotions. So silence is good for the brain. And it makes sense when we're stressed out or constantly distracted, it's hard for our brains to grow. And herein lies the importance of date nights. So just like our brain development, it is so important for our spiritual lives to develop. Without silence, we can't expect our faith to grow. We have to find times to silent the world around us the stress, and the distractions. Silence doesn't have to be silent. And I know that's kind of weird to think, but like in prayer, we find silence, but our heart and our conversation with God is not. It's our date with God. As we go into this time of silent prayer, it doesn't mean our prayer with God should be in silence, but it should be a time to leave distractions and worries behind and have a conversation with God. Please join me in a time of silent prayer as we be still and know. Our Heavenly Father, we forget sometimes the importance of being without distractions in our lives and just to focus on you. Help us grow in our faith through times of silence, but not silent prayer. Continue to be with us as we grow spiritually through you. In these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today, we meet with Isaiah chapter 5, 1 through 7. I will sing for the Lord my love a song about his vineyard. My love will have a vineyard on the old hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stone and planted it with a choice of mine. He built a white tower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwelling in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my men. What more could we could have been done for my men than I have done for it? When I look for grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my men. I will take away its heads, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither plume or cultivating, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clown not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord God Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the lines he delighted in, and he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. May God bless the world at this meeting. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our song of commitment, Lord, I Need You. You can find the words printed on the front of your worship order. I invite you to please stand as we sing together. Without you 
Please be seated. Today's mission moment is about Trinity's food bin ministry. Trinity partners with the Madison Assistance Program to provide food bins for families in need. The food bins will have things like pancake mix, cornmeal, flour, spaghetti, and a jar of spaghetti sauce. It will also have yams, a box of potato flakes, several cans of vegetables, cranberry sauce, a cake mix, and icing. The idea is that a family could use this for their Christmas meal if they choose to do that. Some Trinity families fill one of the empty bins and use that as a chance to talk to their children about why some families need this help and that we have a responsibility to help others. Trinity has adult Sunday school classes that choose to fill several bins as a class project. Please pray silently for all those who will receive the bins and for those who will fin fill these bins as well. Amen. Thank you. Enjoyed the uh, youth getting to sing for us. They sang in early worship as well. Did a great job. It's really nice for you to bless us with that. Did a wonderful job on the flute there too. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention to you that I think every Sunday is a very special Sunday. It's a great reason for us to gather because God has given us this wonderful Lord's Day to worship. And I always find great meaning when we gather together. I remember that the Lord said, where two or three are gathered in His name, He is there among us. And I often feel the Lord's Spirit uh, in Sunday's church in a way that I don't anywhere else in the world. But I want you to let you know as we end 2019, the next several weeks are indeed very special services for us. In December, we will celebrate and remember Advent and Christmas and all those wonderful services that happen around that. 
I hope you'll be paying attention and looking forward to those things. It's a great place to invite people in our world today who still have a lot of nostalgia and, and thoughts about what Christmas can mean. And we know something about the reason for the season. Uh, and then next Sunday, we begin it in a way for me, always the Sunday before Thanksgiving with a special prayer service. So next Sunday is our annual day where we take most of the time in our worship service to devote to different experiences of prayer, ways to pray and engage God uh, in times of both silence and in prayers of different ways that we might not normally do that. And I've always enjoyed that a lot. We will also celebrate the ordinance of baptism during worship next Sunday too. So that'll be a wonderful day for us. Matt Nock joined our church this morning upon his baptism. He'll be baptized next Sunday during late worship. So I just want to let you know about those things coming up and be ready to end this year in a really good spiritual note as we devote these wonderful services, not only to our congregation, but to God as we come to worship and learn and grow together. So you may have heard about this fisherman who would only keep fish he caught that were 18 inches or, or shorter uh, in length. He wouldn't take anything longer than 18 inches. And if somebody asked him about that, why do you throw these bigger fish that you catch away? And he said, well, because I've got an 18 inch pan. Nothing else bigger than that's gonna fit in the pan. I've always liked that story, and it reminds me a lot of the way we tend to, to treat God. We sometimes try to fit God into a box or a small frying pan, if you will. We take this great, wonderful, majestic God we have, and we try to make God smaller than God really is. Oftentimes that happens because we're going through a very difficult time. We go through times of darkness, times of pain, times of uncertainty. And in those times, those things become very large. And our God seems to be small. It fits into the box. And we have concepts of how God can or cannot act in those situations. In 1952, J.B. Phillips wrote a wonderful book called Your God is Too Small. And he talked about how we, in 1950s, had become so far as humanity who had learned about experiences of the world, of nature, of scientific achievements, understanding of ourselves and psychology and so forth. But he also said this, our, despite all the discoveries, our ideas of God have remained largely static. And I think that's true. So the Bible is here to help us so that God doesn't remain in a box. The Bible wants to teach us about how great and majestic God is. And as we listen to it over and over again, we begin to learn more and more about this God that we worship that is very much outside the box in many ways for us. In John's Gospel, the writer says at the end of it, there's a lot of more stories, a lot more words that could be written about Jesus, but these have been written so that you might believe and you might have life. So in the last several weeks, in the fall, we've been looking at the Old Testament. And I hope you've been sort of following along the trajectory of the story of God in the Old Testament. Because as we begin to further along in the story, we're learning more and more about this God that is both good, but also great. Greater than many of us could ever imagine God to be. And certainly bigger than the boxes or the little frying pans that we oftentimes put God in. And so now we've come to the prophets. We've learned about how God is relentless in God's love for you and me. God chooses for whatever reason not to give up on us, even if we're apathetic, if we wander from God, if we sinfully refuse to obey God. For whatever reason, God is relentless in trying to keep up with us and being faithful to us. And when the prophets come, they come to warn us, they come to challenge us, they come to comfort us, and they come to remind us who we are and who God is. And perhaps the greatest of all those prophets in the Old Testament, and my favorite book, I think, of all the prophets, is the book of Isaiah. Isaiah comes from the 8th century B.C., a long time ago. He got his calling after the king Uzziah died. He went to the temple and said, I felt like the whole place was shaking. The whole world was shaking when the king died. And there he felt the presence of God in the midst of that terrible time. And in the midst of that, he sees and experiences a wonderful worship experience, and he hears the beings of heaven saying, Holy, holy, holy. And he receives a call to go and tell the people something. And that message, he will be a messenger, a prophet. And then he uses the words that we often hear when we commission missionaries, Here am I, send me. That's all from Isaiah. And Isaiah is the one that does that. So his first message that he will share is an image of a farmer who has a big vineyard. 
a vineyard that he's been working on from the very beginning of plowing and preparing the soil, digging a trench around it, making sure there's a gate and a wall to protect it and all those things and tending it for a long time. When I was at an Alabama game a few weeks ago, there was a lot of people down there, and one of the people that I saw was a street preacher. Have you ever seen a street preacher? He had a big pole with a lot of signs on it, sort of pro projecting out the message he wanted to have. He had a microphone, and he was preaching as everybody went by, and he would give out some tracts or cards or something like that. And this is sort of the way Isaiah does it. He goes to a very public place at the gates of the entrance of the city and begins to preach his message. But instead of preaching it, he sings his message. This is a song that we heard Amy read for us this morning. It's a love song. And I think in some ways that's okay because there's sometimes when words just don't do and a song gets across a message and touches us in our souls in a ways that, you know, somebody talking can't do. You remember Jim Croce once saying this, because every time I tried to tell you, the words just came out wrong. So all I have to say, I love you in a song. Some of you remember that. But this is a sad song. It's not a happy song. It's a song of a farmer who has high expectations after all the work he had done for this vineyard. And Isaiah will say, the farmer is God and the vineyard is God's people. God has all these expectations for us after all the investment of time and effort in our lives to produce these wonderful, wonderful grapes, the wonderful fruit. And when harvest time comes, with all the expectations, the farmer comes to the vineyard and there's only sour grapes. And literally, it means stinky fruit. And you think about all the work God had done, and the result is a bunch of stinking fruit. And what God hears from the society of these people are cries. He hears voices of crying coming to Him, crying because the society is just not right. Things are not the way they should be. Things are, are, are not done in a justly manner. The right things are ignored, and the wrong things are lifted up. And God hears all of this. So Isaiah said, there are six groups of people who deserve woes from God. And you never want to get a woe from God, but six groups do. These groups hear the woes from this prophet. The first group is a group that's very greedy. They have decided to get as much as they can. These are land grabbers. And they take up so much land, they no longer have local neighbors that they even understand or recognize. There are partiers. Woe to you partiers. You feast and have a great time all the time and you enjoy your life without any thought of people who don't have what you have. Without the, the, any thought of people who lack. So woe to you. What, low to, woe to you who have a lack of morality. And they go around just doing whatever they think is right in their own eyes so that they can no longer tell the difference between what is right and wrong in the world. And woe to you self-made wise men who think you've done it all yourself. You don't need anybody. You don't need God. And woe to you who work the system. You go around the rules to get your own way because the ends justify the means. Mostly, Isaiah says, these people are full of ingratitude. Isaiah says it this way, the ox and the donkey that feed at the food that the farmer puts in the manger, they're more gracious and glad than you are as people toward God. So last week, we heard about all these emotions in God as God looks at our situation and has a sense of how can I let them go, though they deserve it. They've turned their backs on me. They ignore me. They don't love me. They won't receive any of this attention I give them, and they're apathetic toward me. This week, God deliberates on that. Last week, God said, well, how can I let them go? This week, God says, what else can I do? What more can I do for my vineyard? What more can I do for you that I've not already done? And so God decides to withdraw from them. Sounds a little shocking, doesn't it? I'm mindful of maybe something like what goes on when, when AA meetings, and they talk about people who finally hit rock bottom. And it's only when they're completely at rock bottom, there's nowhere further to fall, that they admit that they need help and that they're ready because they have a problem. Maybe that's it. Sometimes we pray to God, Thy will be done. That's part of the Lord's Prayer. And this is a reverse. God is almost saying to the people, Okay, Thy will be done. You don't want me. You won't listen to me. You won't try to obey me. Then your will be done. And God begins to step back. Elizabeth Actemeyer, who was a great Old Testament professor, said this, Apart from God's continuing guidance, we don't really know how to live. So in love, God gives us directions 
to point the way to wholeness and life and joy. But she says, sometimes, of course, we do not like the directions that God gives us. Now, these people are going to the temple. It's important to know that. They're doing the ritual stuff. They attend when the Sabbath day comes, and they go through all the motions, but their hearts are not touched. So when they leave the temple, you can't tell any difference that they've been in God's presence at all. They go out and act in such a way that they've created a society where the right things are not being done, the wrong things are being lifted up. And those who cry out for help and all those we heard the woes, those people are crying out to God. They've created a society because they've chosen to live as if God only stays in the box of the temple, as if God may not even be real. So God, who cares deeply about us and has emotions about us, Remember Hosea last week? How can I leave them? They're my children. Now God says, well, what else could I do? I've done so much for them. What else could I do? So God withdraws. And I'll admit, it's very shocking to hear a story in the Bible about God withdrawing from us. Even if we put God in a box and we sort of limit what God can do anyway, it is still surprising to us. But then after all, we've got to confess, what else can God do? And that's a problem. That's where a lot of us tend to land, especially when things happen to us in our lives and we feel in a dark place. We begin to say, well, after all, what else can be done? And because we have bought God in a box or a small frying pan, we even say, well, after all, what more could God do in this situation? But the fact is, there is more. There is always more that God can do. So instead of hearing God say in exasperation, well, what more could I do? I'm hearing God say, let me think. Now, what more can I do? That seems to be more the character of God. When I first read this passage, I was a little surprised by it. And then I jumped forward for some reason and thought about the more that God has done. We live on this side of the cross. There is more that God has done. At some point, God chose to send God's Son for us. And Jesus chose to accept that mission, to do the more of walking up the hill of Calvary, carrying His cross, and being pinned down on it, dying for our sins on the cross. And God raised Him up on Easter, on Resurrection Day. There is more that God has done already for us. The, point, the fact is, my faith and my own life story, and I think maybe yours, if you think about it, maybe your faith tells you that despite the box we put God in or the problems or the darkness we find ourselves in, there really is always more that God can do, isn't there? I have to be careful to remind myself of that. Because dark days and problems can be so overwhelming and so big that oftentimes God seems small. And because I put God in a box so many times, I try to limit what I think God... I try to control what I think God is able to do. God seems smaller than the big things I'm going through at the time. I, I remember a story of a Latin American baseball player who came to the United States... Couldn't speak any English. He was learning. And at some point, a reporter asked him, what was your favorite word you've been learning, English words? And through a translator, he said, you never know. That was his favorite word. I like that. And I think that's true of God, too. Our faith tells us about God not to let God stay in the box because with God, you never know. There's a story I saw of a little boy who was sitting by a guy, and the guy said, I'll tell you what, kid. If you can tell me something God can do, I'll give you a shiny apple. And the kid thought for a minute, he said, if you can tell me, mister, something God can't do, I'll give you a whole barrel of apples. Because there's always more that God can do. Despite what our boxes tell us, there's always more. I read a blog this week, and they were answering the question, what are the best toys that's ever been? What are the five best toys? And the blogger came up with these five things. and see if you agree or not. A stick... A box, a string, a cardboard tube, and dirt. <laughs> Those are the five things. He said they're readily available, they're versatile, appropriate for all ages, every budget, powered by imagination, and no batteries required. Powered by imagination. Imagination is a powerful thing in our lives. 
And it's very powerful in our spiritual lives if we would get back in touch with it. The box pushes imagination away. We can't imagine God doing more. I, I remember when I was first coming up here to Trinity several years ago, and I was driving back and forth from where our family lived at the time. There were these billboards I would see for this jeweler, and it, something on the slogan would always say, if you can dream it, Donnie can create it. Some of y'all seen that before. And that's imagination, isn't it? If you can dream it. Robert Kennedy said this, Some men see things as they are and ask why, but I see things and I dream of things that never were, and I ask why not. Eugene Peterson talks about spiritual imagination. And he says spiritual imagination gives us the capacity to make some connections between heaven and earth that we desperately need. Connections between our present and our past and our present and our future. Or Picasso. Picasso said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. And that's a problem. It's a problem in our faith walk. Because we tend to get boxes out as we get older and put God in it. When we were kids, we believed God could move mountains. We believed that God could walk on the water, tell any storm to be still, and it would be still. Chase away any demon. Heal any person. But then we get older and we learn about boxes and we try to put God in it. Or we get small frying pans and that's where God belongs. When we put God in a box, whether we realize it or not, we are stifling the necessary spiritual imagination that God created us with in the very beginning of our lives. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, nobody can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again unless we get help to see it. And I want to ask you to see if you can see it by looking at your own story. Review your own life. Putting on the spiritual imagination, the eyes of faith, I bet you will find a story in your life where you were in a place when you thought, I don't know how I'm going to get over this, how I'm going to get through it. I don't know how I'm going to endure. I don't know how I'll overcome, but you did it. You did it. And through the eyes of faith, you will say, I think God helped me in that. And it's hard to describe it, but you feel it deeply that somehow God gave you that guidance, that wisdom, that strength, that support that you needed, and you got through it. This is one of the images I have of God. And it's not just for play into the crowd, but God is an engineer. God is an engineer who never stops working the problem, never gives up on you and me. When God says, what more can I do? This is an honest question from a God who loves to work the problem, who will never quit on you and me. Mary says that she remembered the moment when she felt like that she and I could be married for life. Back in college, I had to replace a rubber gasket on a refrigerator door. I got very emotionally involved in that project, I can tell you that. But Mary and I did it, and she thought if we could endure that, we could probably endure anything. And, but we worked the problem. We kept on stretching and pulling and figuring it out till we got it. And that's my image of God. I think of God that way. God who will keep working on the problem. There's a stump of a nation. It's all been cut off and nothing can live from the stump. But God says, I will bring up a shoot from the stump so that a whole new tree that can bear wonderful fruit will exist. Old Abraham and Sarah, who could imagine that they would ever be the parents of a great nation? But they are. They're parents of a great nation, and their firstborn child they call laughter. And Joseph, sold into slavery into Egypt, ends up helping feed the whole known world at that time. And Joseph says, you meant what happened to me for harm, but God found a way to create something good out of it. And that is the story of God. Throughout the Scriptures and in our own stories, in our own lives, the God who works very hard on the problem, sometimes a problem we create, Sometimes a problem we find ourselves in, but God works to wring out some good in times when we think nothing good can come out of this. What more could God do? And yet, God continues to do more. Jesus finds a way to lift a woman up out of the dust, caught in adultery, and by the rules, deserves to be stoned. But Jesus finds a way to lift her up and says, Go on, I don't condemn you, and live the best life you could ever live. And they turn God turns the worst persecutor of the church into the greatest missionary of the church, the Apostle Paul. 
Jesus once said in the Gospel of Matthew, Humanly speaking, this is all impossible, but with God, everything is possible. God can even turn your bitterness into sweetness. When we fall, when we fail, when bad things happen in threes to our lives, when we struggle to change, there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel. We're tempted to give up on God because our box has taught us that God can only do certain things. Our frying pan's just simply too small. But our faith tries to break light into us. And the stories of our scriptures and the stories of our own life, if we look at it with a spiritual imagination of the eyes of faith, will teach us that God is able. God is able. I mean, what good is our faith if we just talk about it in here and then we try to live it out there as if God lives in a box and is not able? We're practically atheists. We don't believe in the God who is able to do much more than we could ever imagine or even ask. I know. I've been there. And what gets in the way is the problem. The mountain seems so big. The darkness is so dark. It seems so engulfing of our lives. And the God we tend to put in a box, look at that box, it's nothing compared to the problems we're going through. And we lose our spiritual imagination. And we wonder, oh, well, what more could be done? What more could God do? Warren Wisby said, nothing paralyzes us in our lives like the attitude that things can never change. We need to be reminded and remind ourselves that God can change things. Our outlook can determine our outcome. If we only see the problems, we'll be defeated. But if we see the possibilities, the God possibilities, even in our problems, we might could find some victory. I get a magazine I've been getting for years, and there's a column that's been running it from the very beginning called the Belly Off Club. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, doesn't it? And, and I can't button my jacket, so I personally take that column to heart. The Belly Off Club is, always tells us a story of somebody whose belly's gotten too big, and they tell us their problem, what happened to the guy in that shape, and then the wake-up call, and then the decision to start exercising, walking, whatever, to eat better, and it's the story of the Belly Off Club. And I like that. And the reason that column continues to be put in that magazine is because from time to time we need to borrow somebody else's story to give us the inspiration we need because our story is still being written. And that's the way it is in church. We used to call it sharing your testimony. You would share your faith story in part not to just tell us all that God had done, but to remind those whose stories are in the darkness right now. Those people whose stories seem so uncertain. Those people who have big mountains that they're facing and they need to lean on your God story. And that is some way is the how of when God's voice can break into a person's life in the darkest moments of their lives in the simple sharing of our God stories with each other. Everybody has one. If I can do it, you can do it. I don't know how I got through it. Well, as I reflect on it, I think God helped me a whole lot. And that's a simple story. Isaiah has it in his own story. It seems that God backs off and withdraws, but then a few chapters later, here is God, like the engineer, working the problem relentlessly, never giving up on us. By the time we get to chapter 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has dawned, a child will be born, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then we get to chapter 11. A shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse. From its roots, a branch that will bear fruit. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. And then in Isaiah 53, one of the most moving passages in all of the Bible, many Christians see this as reflecting on what Jesus endured. Isaiah says, Who has believed? What we've heard. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before us like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at Him, nothing in His appearance that we should desire Him. 
He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him as no account. But surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that has made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All of us are like sheep who go astray. We've all turned to go our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Jesus is dying up here on the cross, some of the religious leaders mock him and they say, he saved others, he can't save himself. And they were sort of right. He saved others. God seems unwilling to give up. Always working the problem. God could abandon us. God could hoe up the vineyard, start all over again. God chooses to be creative and to save, to work the problem that we find ourselves in. Wringing good out of something we thought could never find any good in it. Redeeming what we think is beyond hope. This is the story of God. When I see this passage, I kept thinking about the cross. I think about the great confession of our faith. The Lord is my Savior. Jesus. This is not some ancient song that belongs in the dusty pages of the Bible about a farmer in a vineyard. This is about God now. It's about God with you and me now in real life situations and real life problems. God chooses to keep working, to not give up. There is always something more that God can do. Our choice is to trust Him, to learn to grow into it, to listen. I'm struck by that question. That God asks, what more can I do? And I think that from time to time in our own lives, God asks that question over our situation. What more can I do? Now, I don't want to trick you. Sometimes the more God will do will be not what we expected it to be. God often surprises us. And for some of us, the more will only happen after this life. But there is always more that God can do. So don't put God in a box. Get a bigger frying pan. Our God is a big God. God is good. God is also great. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church. And I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep